Welcome to the Medical Mnemonist Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each episode, take a journey into the top techniques for medical mnemonics, study skills, board exam tips, and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Welcome back, everyone. We're joined today by Miguel Molina, who's the COO of Medical Joyworks. And in case you forgot, we have been joined by Medical Joyworks before. Last time was the CEO and co-founder, Nayana. And we are going to get an update on some of the great apps at Medical Joyworks, such as Prognosis and the Clinical Odyssey and a few other things that have changed since our last interview. So Miguel, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Ah, uh, it's been a long time since Medical Joyworks has been on the show, and it's great to have a uh, a different viewpoint, I'd say, of the company, of the learning aspects, of the tools and technologies that are really shaping medical education. I know that Prognosis was an app that was out when I was in med school, and that was pretty interesting and fun. And since then, you guys have made a, a lot more content. And as I've learned more about what goes into that content creation. It seems pretty intensive, so it sounds like we're going to have a very informative interview here with not only what the company is doing, what it has been doing, what's going on now, but also some of the process there and why the material is, uh, we'll say, high quality. Yeah, yeah, and, and and I think I, or, or I hope I can bring some distinct insight because unlike you and Dr. Nayana, I am not a doctor. So I, I don't know if, if you've had people who are not physicians in your podcast before. So It happens from time to time. It does. But as long as we're talking about education, especially medical education, then uh, you know we're providing some insights and benefits to the listeners, the audience, then it's definitely worth hearing those different insights and different viewpoints. Righty. I was looking over the website again recently, and so much has changed since the last time I really had gone over it. and. The content has, uh, we'll say it's been elaborated on, but also you have so many different segments, these different modules. You have, uh, like I said earlier, Prognosis, Your Diagnosis, which is also a, a fun mobile app that anyone can download for free. You have Clinical Sense. You have Explain Medicine um, and, and Clinical Odyssey. And just, I guess, a brief overview of what all these different modules are and do they interact with each other? What should... Uh, maybe a learner that's new to the platform know about these and how to use them? Sure. Okay. So the, we have four titles specifically prognosis, your diagnosis, clinical sense, explain medicine, and the newest one, QBank prepper. These four offer clinical skills development in a difference in different capacities. QBank Prepper is essentially a, a question bank that follows the USMLE Step 2 CK format. Then you have Explain Medicine, which are short reference articles that combine fact explanation pairs across different aspects of, of, a, of a condition or, or, or different yeah, aspects of a condition or a disease. Then comes prognosis, your diagnosis, which is interactive. First two are not interactive, whereas prognosis, your diagnosis is short game. It allows you to improve your initial diagnosis skills. And the game is designed in a way that it's not one directional. So you can make your investigations. You're presented with a, with a patient or a, a situation you can then perform your initial investigations. Then you move on to your initial management. If you feel that something's not right, you might you can even go back to your investigations and come back to management. And then eventually you get your results and then there's an explanation for those results. And then finally, we have clinical sense. Clinical sense is also an interactive format. It is essentially for patient management over time. So whereas prognosis investigates a patient initially, clinical sense lets you treat a patient through you know, multiple circumstances as they progress in, in 
several days or weeks or, or whatever you, you have. I just wanted to step in real quick because I, I have experience with prognosis in the past. There is a basically it's I would for the audience, I would say it's comparable to like studying for step two in a way because you have this patient presentation, a short description. And the thing I really liked about it is the visuals that you have for the patients. You kind of get a little bit of a sense of just is this an acute or chronic condition? Is it really severe? Like, does a little cartoon picture of the patient look really bad? And that can help. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> that can help so much. I mean, one of the issues that I have with QBanks, being that I'm such a visual person, is when I'm just reading text, not to mention having uh, dyslexia, <laughs> it's a little more difficult, but it's hard to really get a full grasp of the patient. So having that little graphic representation can, at least in my mind, make a huge difference in what you're looking for, what you're expecting. Um, and actually that uh, led me to try to mess around with a video cue bank a couple of years ago. The prognosis format, is, unlike the, the clinical sense, it gives you that in the, in the presentation of the patient, we use the visual also to provide additional information. So it's, it's a cool little, little image uh, or a fun little image, and if you remember, it also is pe it's peppered with, with other data, specific or, or essential to understanding the, the patient presentation. In clinical sense, we use the imagery differently. The imagery is used to uh, convey um, not so much uh, quantitative data, but to convey qualitative data about the patient's emotional state, um, the patient's con uh, context, right? But we use them, we use the visuals uh, with a purpose in both, in both instances. When we introduce QBank Prepper, obviously it's nothing like prognosis or clinical sense, but we felt that uh, we wanted to give our, our customers the, the possibility to really try and, and, and take the, the, the MCQ or, or take an MCQ that resembles as much as possible what is going to be provided in the USMLA Step 2 CK, right? And those, unfortunately, are very direct. They don't have an image or anything. So we figured... Well, let's let's try and resemble that experience as much as possible because when you combine that with studying with prognosis or studying with clinical sense, uh, it, it it has a greater impact for you, right? And also that there's so many uh, question banks out there that we've looked at that we just feel that oh well, you know they're not bad, but we we personally we could do better. So I think you're actually going backwards by making a Q bank there. <laughs> Uh, really, the USMLE should be moving forwards into more visuals uh, and probably mimicking your material more. So I hope they hear this podcast. I, I hope they hear you. <laughs> you got to give the the people what they need at the time. So that's an interesting point too, because if there are so many QBangs out there, and we all know some of the big names, some that have been around forever, and as far as I know, there's no real good qualitative data to say that one's better than another or really to measure it. There's just too many variables, too many students, and not a whole lot of transparency either. So what made you guys think that maybe we should go into making a QBank and, and how do you think yours is maybe different than some of the bigger names that the students, the audience might know about? Well, let me, let me, tell, you, let me tell you how we got started with a QBank, right? And, and before I forget, all these four titles Right. They're, they're, they're different formats, prognosis, clinical sense, explain medicine, and QBank prepper. I just remember, they all are offered under one roof, and that's called Clinical Odyssey. Right? So the Clinical Odyssey platform, when you access that, you have access to the four titles. Or three of the four titles exist independently, or a portion of them exist independently as mobile apps on the app store and on Google play. So explain medicine, clinical sense, and prognosis. We offer a percentage of the content, 12% of the content, 10 to 12% of the content is available for free on the mobile apps. And if you want access to the full library, which is 700 and plus learning modules, uh, those are available under the clinical Odyssey name. So 
when we launched Clinical Odyssey, that's when we introduced QBank Prepper. And QBank Prepper is only available under, under Clinical Odyssey. And the story behind QBank Prepper was that originally we wanted to do a more playful app, the way we had done Clinical Odyssey and Explain Medicine with the MCQ concept in mind. So thinking along the lines of what you said, which is have the USMLE move forward rather than us move backward to them. And no offense to the USMLE folks. I mean, we've met a, uh, we've had we we've had interactions with them at some point in our lives, and very good people. The thing about the going down that path was that the key here was what was really the objective of the tool. Clinical sense and prognosis, and to an extent, explained medicine are really intended not just to pass the USMLE step two. They're really intended to help you improve your skills over time, whether you are preparing for the USMLE or whether you're already a practicing physician and you just want to stay current, right? Our tools work great in that regard. If you're going to produce something that has a very specific objective, like helping the customer achieve a milestone, like the USMLE step two, uh, you have to just try and adapt to the format as much as possible. And so, so after several trials and whatever, what we felt was that what we were producing was really good, uh, this concept we had, but it just didn't exactly meet the requirements of the test itself. So we said, okay, well, let's, let's, let's adapt the test. Let's follow the test parameters as much as possible. And we introduced the, the QBank prepper that way. And we realized also that, well, sometimes people, especially our audience who, is a, who are students, is not everybody that works on, uses our products are students, but that audience that uses students would definitely benefit from that. And that's, and that's how we came up with, and, and that's how we introduced it. In terms of the difference, because you asked me, I think about the difference between our QBank and, and others. Well, we're definitely going to have to get into some of the, the learning science yeah. behind your materials as well, but it's funny. It's the quality. It's the quality. I have to, <laughs> I have to throw that one at you because everyone at least everyone I've spoken to that's in the QBank making business uh, to some degree or another thinks that theirs is the best. So I have to <laughs> elaborate what makes sure is the best. Oh, but... really? Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if they put it that way, um, no, we are the best of the best. Here's the thing. An MCQ is an MCQ, especially if it's following a format. I mean, it has a stem or the clinical vignette, and then it has the, the answer options and that's it. In our case, we apply the exact same quality process, quality assurance process for the QBank Prepper product as we do for everything else, right? And our content creation process has a quality assurance program that is extremely ambitious. So for every dollar we spend in producing in content, 90 cents of that goes to quality assurance. Okay. And I mean, not our operating costs, but the, 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 the money spent on content production itself in the, in the company. And this is across the board. We don't make exceptions just because it's MCQ and it may seem more boring. That is completely irrelevant. In fact, we enjoy producing the MCQs as much as we produce as we enjoy producing all the other content. So I think that that reflects when you see the MCQs. The second distinction is that when you, we don't sell the MCQs just as a Q bank separately. That was a purpose, that, that was a decision or a conscious decision. You go to other players in the market and they will sell you the books, they will sell you the access online for a limited time, and you just have the MCQs. We include that as part of your subscription to Clinical Odyssey, meaning that you have access to all the content. The MCQ is the extra. We don't make the MCQ the centerpiece. The centerpiece for our, for our platform is Clinical Sense, Prognosis, the two interactives, the discussion board, the, mod the physician-moderated discussion board, and then you've got MCQ the next round. The other distinction is that our MCQs you have your answer options, but there are explanations behind every answer option. So we actually explain why this is not the answer. 
as well as why this one is the answer or the best answer. Because mind you, the, the format for, for USMLE, it's not that you have wrongs and rights, you have to really present the best plausible an, uh, option among many plausible options. So th- I think those are the main distinctions uh, and, and the price. Yeah, some of the pricing is very ridiculous. I, I specifically try to push people away from using, even if they're big names, it, it really shouldn't eat away at your savings that much just to study a little bit when there are great other resources. They're, they're just not easy to understand sometimes. So you end up breaking, looking at it and breaking down and, and you were look, trying to determine the price per MCQ. And depending on the plan you buy, it can be anywhere between eight cents and fifty cents. And um, we were just scratching our heads is like, wow, there, there's so much complexity in it. And so we're we're not necessarily cheaper, but we certainly, because it's part of the, the clinical IC bundle, we we think that we have something that is far more easy to understand and appealing to to the user. Okay, so then I have to kind of go into this a little. I'm curious to know, maybe if you have any research on this, I'm not sure, but from my personal experiences, from what I've read before, you know, the, especially the visual aspect of certain materials can be very helpful. And also the, the mentorship um, that can happen, the immediate feedback, which sounds like you have quite a, a bit of on your forums, which is not something that I see on a lot of other platforms. So between you know, the immediate feedback there, which goes into a lot of different learning psychology, educational psychology um, principles, and then the extra visual mediums that you have with like prognosis, clinical sense. Have you noticed or do you know any research that really helps to emphasize if that's much better for students, especially medical students? You know, that's a really good question. We have devoted, when we look at the, the published research that's out there, we have devoted our attention toward gamified learning more than anything that has visual. So I cannot say if there's something on that, that discusses or, or, or looks into using visuals in medical learning, but we have looked at gamification, right? Because clinical sense and, and prognosis, which were the first apps we came up with, um, are, are, are down that, that path, right? And a lot of the research, surprisingly, is, is more descriptive than, than anything else. So it, if we got a bit frustrated looking at what academia was doing because they, there isn't that much that really goes into the impact inside the classroom over an extended period of time. Now, we know that uh, because we've had seven plus million downloads in the last 10 years that uh, people will find the formats very, not just appealing, but very useful to them because they keep coming back. They keep wanting to use them. We even have users that are like super users. Sometimes we'll detect, we'll notice that um, when we're when we're just doing maintenance in our system and checking stuff out, we'll see that uh, or a pop up that uh, that a user will be playing the same learning module thirty times, and we're thinking, well, this is an error in our in our data. And we reach out to them, it's like, hi, uh, is everything okay? Or are you struggling? Is it that the system, the tool's crashing on you, or or something going on? Is because you're playing the same thing thirty times? Like, no, I'm preparing for a test. And your your game is so great that the, <laughs> I want to play it over and over to test. I said, "Oh, well, let me just give you a feature where you can like access the the explanations a bit more easy rather than have to play it again." And that's how we came with the explanations at the end. I mean, this was a few years back, but but we had a lot of folks like this in in in, in some in Eastern Europe and here in the United States that that were really doing that. And I mean, I mean, we're talking about over a hundred times playing the same learning module, even. So that caught our attention. And then people who played our apps maybe six, seven years ago, they're coming back to us and requesting that we help them uh, train their junior staff members or helping them train their, uh, their, their students because they've moved on as well. They've either moved into academia or industry. 
and uh, they remember the experience and now they're reaching out to us for for having more uh, to, to have a greater impact so we think that that you know it's not exactly um academic research but it is a proof of concept or, or more than proof of concept it is validation that the that the designs and the formats that have imagery really work. I'd be concerned if someone was redoing the same question 30 to 100 times that, huh, maybe they're not learning this material, but it sounds like they were no. just enjoying it. Well, uh, it's, it's, this was a prognosis. This, this was uh, someone working with a prognosis learning module. A prognosis learning module has anywhere between 800 and 1500 words. Right. So, so, so we're very meticulous about this. We, any, yeah, anywhere between eight, 1500, that includes the text that is presented in the, in the funky, the cool little image that you were describing earlier. Um, about 80% of the text in a prognosis learning module is explanations. Really going in depth as to explaining uh, the, the 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 investigations you do, you use the management you use, and and also the findings and the re- the rationale behind it and all that. So if you look at it that way, I mean that's there's there's a lot of valuable content there, and then you top it off with the take home message and the references. So I wouldn't be surprised if the person is like really distilling, going through those eight hundred those that that eight, that those thousand plus words of of succinct medical theory and then looking also at the references that we uh add because we we cite everything that we do and um they're probably and and again our our references are all open access that is a company policy we don't offer i mean everything that we that we produce um we make sure that the references are available to anyone anywhere on the planet at no additional cost so they are able to look into that and our, our, our thoughts here that they're probably like cross-checking. Right? They, they access the reference, they go back. And then if you do it that way, you, you could spend a few hours. The, the problem in this case was that he had to play to get to the explanation. And if for whatever reason he left and then came back, he would have to play again to get to the explanation. <laughs> so we, we, we made it easier for him. So. And for everyone. Okay. That, that makes more sense. Yeah. I remember playing it many years ago and it was very interesting. You get a very brief description of what's going on, chief complaint kind of stuff. And then uh, it'll ask you between three or four different answer options. Like, what do you want to do next? And sometimes they're tests, sometimes they're medications, but at least the thing that I thought was different in that compared to a lot of regular MCQs is that they're checkboxes and you can select multiple choices, which adds quite a level of difficulty. It's not just choose the, choose the best one there, but you know, you have to be as accurate as possible. And I think you, you got badges depending on what percentage you got correct. Something along those lines. Stars. That's what it was. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I don't think I ever got a, a really good score there, but it was a long time ago before I knew what I know now. Oh, hopefully, know now. You see, you're a, you're a, you're a doctor. You're, I'm I'm not. I, I can get away with not scores. I I kill my patients all the time. Um, <laughs> the, the 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 story here. Yes, the again. Keep in mind that they're not for a specific test, right? So, Q bank pepper is for a specific test, and and we try to resemble that. Prognosis and clinical sense, really, when you look into the thought process, coming back to the, how, how we produce these things, the, the, the thought process here is, with prognosis, how do you resemble as much as possible the initial diagnosis process? You're presented with a situation, you have very little information, you have to do investigation. Sometimes you don't know if you need to do one or the other, so you start with one. You learn something, then maybe you go back and do another one, right? If you're really... Uh, uh, I was reading in an article, I think it was in the New York Times a uh, couple of years back, something about how there was this questioning is like, is the good physician really the one who sends you to do all kinds of crazy tests? Or is the really good physician the one that just sends you to do the one test to get to the, to the, to the diagnosis, right? And it's interesting because this was a, a big debate, in, at least in, in that article. But that's precisely what we've been wondering and playing with with prognosis. 
how do you get better at this? So sure, we have these options. You check one box and then you realize that you need to uncheck it and check the other. The game lets you do that. And you may have to check multiple because again, we're resembling, we're, we're trying to replicate or simulate the experience of initial diagnosis. Not and, and that applies for everyone, whether you're preparing for a test or whether you're in residency or you're an intern or, or you're already a practicing physician. And hence why we have student uh, customers across the whole spectrum. That's one of my biggest concerns and complaints with how a lot of the material is right now, especially the standardized exams, is they're so different, just completely separate reality than actually seeing patients. And especially now when, you know, the past two years, basically, a lot of students have been either extremely restricted or even not even allowed in hospitals in certain states due to COVID. So they're not getting the actual hands-on clinical experience they need. And the tests are great for testing certain bits of knowledge, but you're missing the the patient interaction. You're missing the emotive, uh, the emotional, the empathy, the all these different aspects that, granted, in prognosis, it's not showing you all of those as well, but uh, a lot more, I would say, than just a, a normal text-based question. So I guess the, the question would be, when are you guys starting with... Uh, augmented reality um we did you just you're in it (laughs) (laughs) Um, no um you know what that that's a that's an interesting one because there's a lot of great companies out there that are that are testing and and doing things with augmented reality none of the names come to mind and, and my apologies for that but we have seen over the last maybe five six years a, a lot of startups and a lot of uh, other brands that are really doing things that are far more visually appealing than what we have. And we've been approached by, by several uh, customers as well as uh, other, other parties with the question is like, well, you have such great content because the, the content really stands out. It's so well, well done. Um, why don't you up your game and go into, into VR or AR or whatever R they're using these days? Um, I mean, there's a certain big company out there in the world that just changed its name precisely to appeal to the, the, the artificial reality universe, right? And uh, probably heard of them, uh, Meta. And um, so, so there's, there's big money. There's big money going. Into this. And the reason we're not, not doing that is because the product is conceived to help the user First, anywhere in the world. So we make the assumption that your internet connection may not be the greatest for starters. The second assumption we make is that your device may not be the greatest because you don't have the budget for it or you're happy with the one that you have in its version like me. I've got a, an S side. It's, it's one of the older Apple phones and I have no intention of changing it. Right. Um, so we make those two very, uh, very important assumptions. It allows us to reach more people that way. And it lets people, it, it reduces that entry barrier for them that they don't feel that they're constrained by the technology. If anything, they feel that they can access what really matters to them, which is the content. So there is some interactivity. There's some playfulness, of course, but they don't have to invest heavily or they don't have to become overly dependent on it. And then the other thing is that we offer very short bursts of learning. So our simulations and our content, or especially prognosis and clinical sense, or even explain medicine, they're all short. When you think about it, 1,500 words, eight or even as low as 800 for a, a prognosis case, um, you start wondering, well, how long is it going to take me to go through this? Right? Even if I have to play it two or three times, it doesn't take you long. It can take four or five minutes. And depending on how fast a reader. Now, Yana is an extremely fast reader. He can do this in two minutes. I am more your average Joe, and, and I'll do it for, for six, seven minutes, right? But the point for us is make it short, make it sweet, make it really robust so that people can get on to doing other things. And, and that, that, puts, that puts you somewhat far from from the AR and VR uh, concepts out there, which again, they're fantastic. And I think that they should be explored. But for us, it's just like, no, it, it kind of goes away, away from our, from our uh, intended, uh, our original concept and our intended objective. 
I'm going to look up some of these companies when we get off this call, but <laughs> I don't know. I picture the future of education being sort of like the, uh, what was the, the first Star Trek reboot movie that came out a couple of years ago and you have little kids Spock in school and they basically have, um, what is it? All, all of the kids have their own booth in a way. And they have this AI computer. They're like doing touch screens in the air. I'm like, all right, that's what education should be like, or, or maybe will be in the near future. But anyway, side tangent. Um, so we, you've covered a lot here. We've covered some of the aspects of like the gamified apps and, uh, the, the visual aspect, how it's different than a lot of other resources. You have several different apps that are available on the different app stores and through your website, all under the big grouping of clinical odyssey a lot of free material which is great all of the references you list are free um, this is based on u.s medicine too in case we haven't mentioned that in the past because sometimes it can get a little confusing but there's one thing we haven't touched yet that i i just had to ask about and that's stolenappgame.com <laughs> funny little little game you can play there <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a uh, that's and and by the way, the movie you're thinking of is Star Trek, the the 2009 film, I think. Yeah, what did I say? Um, no, no, that, that's correct. That's correct. It's just oh, okay. that you know you, they they have Star Trek and then they have Into Darkness and Beyond. So I think the logic was you go from Star Trek, then you go into darkness and beyond darkness. That was the logic of the trilogy. Um, but um, I, I may be wrong on that, so don't quote me. Um, my 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 tracker skills are a bit outdated. Well, you're quoting yourself when we uh, post this, so uh. yeah. The the stolen app, the stolen app. Okay, so so um, there's not too much I can say about it in the sense that uh, so so this is um this is a fictional story based on a real story. Um, the stolen app game is essentially prognosis. It's our prognosis format, our our fun little initial diagnosis. And, uh, but this, it is about, not about medicine, but about how a certain learning app was stolen by some other, uh, company out there and, uh, what the, what has happened with it. Right. So it, you, you get to play it and you look at it from different perspectives. You, you get to play it as a, uh, again, it's a modification of the prognosis concept. I mean, it still is the same design, but the, the the logic of the learning is very different. In case you've lost the audience at this point, let me just throw in for their background reference <laughs> that I've seen a, a couple of online articles in the past regarding some legal concerns because, well, basically Medical Joy Works had some copyright issues. Okay, so let, let's let's all right. It, it, fine, you you want to talk about this? Okay, <laughs> all right. Here here's what's going on. We had our content stolen. That's essentially what it comes. Well, not just the content. We had the whole app stolen. That's what it comes comes down to, right? Uh, some very uh, not so um, uh, not so nice people came up and saw the prognosis app, and uh, you know, a team of two hundred plus employees, or or, or a company of two hundred plus people. Sorry with uh, a whole bunch of, of, of resources available to them, they couldn't come up with anything better, but just clone our app and take our content verbatim, including the typos. Because occasionally, occasionally we do have a typo or two in our, in our materials. And yeah, then they went out and released it, claiming it was theirs and it was their invention. And uh, we took them to court and we got their materials uh, banned from from the app store and from Google play that that is still, uh, being fought out in the courts. So I can't say much beyond that, but that is essentially the, the, the gist of the story here. Um, we started in 2010 and these folks started, uh, about, I think, I don't know, but maybe no more than four years ago, I think. So they actually were, Oh yeah, it was. I mean, and then the whole thing, the whole thing, the 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 cute little cartoons. They took the the layout, everything. They didn't even ch they, they they didn't change anything. Even the name, ours is prognosis colon your diagnosis. They came up with something like whatever colon whatever. Um, our marketing, I we realized as I was reading the marketing, say like, wait a minute, I wrote that stuff. 
or my marketing team wrote that stuff. And uh, so, yeah, they, they really went all out and uh, we went all out and, and are fighting them back. Hence, this is, this is still in the, in the courts and being sorted out. So it's, it's very unpleasant. And as we started digging, this happened over the summer. And uh, that's when we realized that, well, you know, intellectual property theft is a real big issue, especially in the digital domain. So we decided to create the stolen app game for people to learn about that because there are some complexities. For instance, I did not know until this happened to us that IP and uh, yeah, intellectual property is a human right. It's like, really? It's, it's, it's sanctioned by the United Nations as a human right. And that was a big eye opener for us. It was like, wow, really? So when you look at what the UN is doing, um, when you look at what the European Union is doing, the United States government and how they're really trying to enforce or educate people and so it's like, hey, protect, it's not just your ideas, but it's how you do certain things, right? And this is, uh, this is, this is your right and, and we're trying to establish mechanisms to protect it. And, and there's a lot of effort going into these, into these matters. Um, so that was one thing that, that really shocked us. The other thing that we learned was about uh, environmental and social governance in investing. A lot of investment. And by the way, these guys are, are VC backed. We're not. We're, we're entirely bootstrapped, right? Um, and uh, except for one grant we received from, from the Chilean government, uh, which was equity free in, in 2012. Everything else that we've done has been entirely uh, on our dime. But this company that stole from us, uh, their parent company is, is VC back to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, right? And uh, when we dug into this to understand, well, what do we do here and what are we fighting? We realized that there's this concept of environmental, social, and governance responsibility in the VC world, which is picking up. And it's essentially talking about how the private equity funds, venture capital firms, um, banks, they need to take these matters into consideration. And their, um, the, the fund managers have fiduciary responsibilities towards their limited partners to pay attention and invest in companies that behave in a certain way. And that responsibility is being driven by the public, by us, because we essentially support a lot of these limited partners. Limited partners in the investment world are pension funds, charities, uh, endowments. Some of these are private, but some of these are big public uh, monies. Right? In the United States alone, I think there's about 26 public uh, public funds that that uh, that are support that support venture capital in the world. So we're talking you know, tunes of billions of dollars, and uh, if the investors are managing this money and putting it into companies whose business is to come and screw small companies in the United States because we are a U.S. company, it just makes you wonder. It's like, well, wait a minute, what's who, who's doing something about this, right? So to connect all those dots to make create awareness for people to connect those dots and see the repercussions of these actions. It's not just about stealing content. It's about how it affects society at large. Uh, that's why we created the stolen app. and We released it out there and, and uh, to, 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 to create awareness. And again, it's, it's, yes, it talks about, I mean, it, it, it is very transparent. It says that, well, this is based on our story. The story in the stolen app is fictional, just so we're clear. Got it. And I think, that is a great place to really leave the audience with some some tasks to do. And I would say go check out stolenapp.com, uh, stolenappgame.com, as well as Clinical Odyssey. Um, would that be clinicalodyssey.com or just go to Medical Joyworks and all of the different modules are available there? You would have to go to clinicalodyssey.com. Um, and in Clinical Odyssey, you can also find out how we create the content, uh, the the quality details that we go into. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a very intensive uh, process. Yeah. So they can read about that too, if, if they're interested. Well, it's been great having you on Miguel Molina from medical joy works. Everyone go check out 
clinicalodyssey.com. And if you get a moment, check out the stolenappgame.com. Well, thank you, Chase. It's, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure being here. It took a while for us to make this happen. We, we've been talking about it, I think, since the summer before the, the stolen app even came into play. Yep, but it's good we finally got it on the books, and I think we have a lot of great information here for the audience. So it's been a pleasure speaking with you and hope to talk again soon. Likewise. Thank you so much. The Medical Mnemonist Podcast is powered by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services, including USMLE tutoring and residency admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for your board exams, and we hope you tune in again next time.